that being said, um, I believe the candidate Hello, guys. Uh, good evening. Thank you guys for sticking in there. I know it's a long meeting, uh, but I want to thank you for coming out and uh, taking this opportunity to hear from uh, the candidates that are here to share what they see of Calvary's would be. Um, part of the reason I'm running is because I was um, I was born into intergenerational poverty here on in Kalamazoo. Um, a second generation um, from so my parents were immigrant workers, and we moved back and forth from Florida to Michigan. Um, and part of the reason I'm running is because there's some things that are taking place within our city that have been ignored for a long time, uh, for a very long time. And I'm running as a young Hispanic male, first time in the history of Kalamazoo, a young Hispanic male running for the mayor position. Uh, first time in 12 years representation of the Hispanic population in Kalamazoo. Um, so it's my honor, my joy. I, I love building relationships with people. Um, I work for a nonprofit called Urban Alliance, where I've started some really sweet um, programs that have impacted. Uh, Kalamazoo's economy. Um, I'm the senior pastor of a church, and I just love the people of Kalamazoo. I love Kalamazoo in general. And so I think, um, yeah, that's why I'm running. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Rob Martinez. Uh, same thing, born with not a lot of money. Uh, a couple, well, five, six years ago, I remember being in this room speaking and trying to develop this neighborhood and there were three people there. So for the last what, years and years I've been trying to push and push. I was one of the first people to bring the car hop over in Ontario. Um, and the same thing, you know, young Latin or Mexican male. My mom lied, she was a migrant worker, she lied and said she was 18 and she got a job at City Hall. And then she had me stop the job. But I think it would be amazing to be coming from a family and uh, be the first young, first black people. Hello, my name Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, I want to start with a story about a young woman named Pat in northern, rural northern Michigan. She was a, she had two young kids. She was a survivor of domestic abuse. She got divorced, spent the next uh, six years in what they would call housing industry, and not more than about six months in any medical place. That was my mom. And as a licensed nurse, licensed practice nurse, she raised my older sister and I for several years until she remarried. And that, that experience has deeply colored the way that I'm approaching this. Because I decided to run when the polar vortex was bearing down this last week. I was at a meeting with one, at one of the churches downtown and was asking the pastor if he had a plan to help the homeless community. And he said he did. He had organized with volunteers, I wanted to be generous here in the audience for him to help set that up. Um, and he had worked with some of the other churches to help get people safe during that time. And it's, you know, it's like a hurricane, we saw this one. Nobody knew, nobody knew, nobody didn't expect that. And what I learned is that the city had a lot of people who were like frozen to the side if he had to step up with the community doctors. That's what pushed me to say the city does not have the right priorities. We need to do better of taking care of the people who need help the most. That's the main reason I'm running. I'm running to listen to people, to have conversations, we knock on thousands of doors, and I'm out there trying to find out what people need. Because I don't think I have all the answers. Uh, I think you don't need something to ask all the answers. You need somebody to understand. Thank you. Hi, I am David Anderson, and I'm running for mayor of the city council. And I'm running because I want to build, continue to build, a council that leaves no one behind. And I am running on my values. 
And my values, I believe, are values that all of us share in this room. We would not be here tonight on the beautiful night council if all of us didn't care about this city and want it to be a great place. The values that I'm running on are these. I believe that government can be a force for good and do the will of the people. I believe in hard work. I believe in fairness and compassion. And I believe that we are here to help take care of each other and community. We've been through some very tough times in the city of Kalamazoo over the last 14 years while I've been serving on the commission. And we're beginning to see that we can change the story and the trajectory here in town. I want to be part of that. I want to build on the good work that's started. I want to make sure that everybody benefits. And I want to make sure that bringing everyone to the table, not leaving anyone out, is going to commit to Kalamazoo, commit to my vision for Kalamazoo, and support that vision. We'll need everybody doing it together. Now we're going to go into the question uh, portion of the forum. Um, can that work? Can that work today? Yeah. Uh, according to the Walton Dictionary of Contemporary English, triple down effect. A belief that additional wealth gained by the rich people in society will have a good economic effect on the lives of everyone because the rich will put extra money into business investment. From the lens of a marginalized citizen, what will a triple up? Like policy look like using the FSB model. First of all, it's, it's, that's not going to happen. Triple down effect never really works. You say it, but you never had money in the hospital. So I don't think. First, you have, you have to educate the people on how to handle it. You have to teach them how to handle finance. I could give every millionaire to give all their money to the urban community. And within a, a year, those same rich people are going to have all the money back. There's not, we don't, we have not taught our kids how to handle finance, how to get into building projects, how to get out, to be smart with their money, saving, saving accounts. And that's the thing we're lacking. So I don't, I don't believe that there's any trickle down or any of that stuff because, like I said, the money's going to come. It's going to go right back to the same thing. So it's, if we don't teach our kids how to be responsible, handle finances, and create their own generational wealth, it doesn't make sense. Uh, Karen, Karen, Karen. Oh, same question? Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> here is my approach to that general idea, is that everyone recognizes that there are populations who've been left outside when it's been when the opportunities to benefit have presented themselves. By intent oftentimes. And that is something we're dealing with as a legacy of a nation, and we're dealing with here in town. So what exactly can we do about that in a practical way? Let's work on building that at the neighborhood level. And one of the things that we're doing with Foundation for Excellence Resources is we are helping minority contractors get licensed. Right now we have 72 local business entities, 72 that are in our business support program, supported by Foundation for Excellence dollars, spent $200,000 so far to help those individuals. In the pipeline, some successful, some not yet. Set between the pipeline. <coughs> this is the work that we can now do. This is the dreaming that we can now imagine that just a few years ago, when we talked about the city of Kalamazoo, we were looking to hire a city manager. We were talking about managing decline. That was the theme. Now we have the opportunity, which I am deeply invested in, to lift up. Is this something that's going to happen overnight? No, it is not. But that's the serious work we have to do, and that's the work that we all have to do together. I am devoted to that. Yes, uh, so uh, a couple different things. Um, when you think about social mobility, 
I think about taking somebody from point A to point B and um, giving them the, the tools that they need to be successful financially or whatever they deem it, uh, whatever they deem successful, right? Um, so part of that is um, understanding that this battle against minimum wage in the urban context, because it sounds so great to people who are, uh, who are poor, $15 an hour sounds really great, right? That will make a world of difference. But this narrative about, around minimum wage is something that's been perpetuated to keep people poor, mm -hmm. right? Because the word minimum is the bottom line. And so we have to change that narrative in our city. We have to be able to provide opportunities for entrepreneurship, right? The city's working on that. Uh, we have to provide technical training. We have to provide uh, skilled trade trainings. And six years ago, I, I created a program called Momentum that has given $6 million back into Kalamazoo's uh, economy. And so that's taking the most marginalized people with felonies, poor work history backgrounds, and pouring into them and giving them the resources they need so that they can do what they have to do to sustain their families. So uh, trickle down economics, for me, the way I see it, it's always been about systemic racism. We, we, we have to think about it from that context because it's keeping the poor poor and keeping the rich rich. And so if we're not willing to address those issues at a city level, we will never see that system change. And so I feel like being mayor, um, I can have those conversations, be real about it, be transparent about it, be authentic about it, so that we can see all of Kalamazoo thrive and, and grow together, right? Um, and so, yeah, um, I'll stop now. <laughs> So this is a great question because it gets at the heart of, of why we're thinking about a new commission and a new mayor and a new direction for the city of Kalamazoo. Because right now and for a long time, the city has been committed to a trickle-down development model. Uh, I mean, how much money are we pouring into downtown year after year after year? Well, sidewalks and our water infrastructure and our roads and everything else across every neighborhood in this community is decaying. And you know, I just read an article today about all how, how smart we're being and innovative ways we're finding to finance an arena in downtown. I mean, why can't we use that, that intelligence and innovation and creative thinking to find ways to build affordable housing? And, you know, what is it that is at the root cause of the, the discrepancy in opportunity? It is housing, it is education, it is health care. And if we want to use Foundation for Access money in some way that is really going to make a difference and transform the lives of people in this community, we should do it for something that's really going to help. Something like uh, health, or, uh, sorry, <coughs> uh, daycare and preschool should, for, for every single member of this community. That will lift so many people up because there's so many people who are working just to pay off daycare. Yeah. Right. Okay. Next question. Everyone in our community deserves access to housing. However, you know, discrimination keeps uh, people from accessing safe and affordable choices at times, resulting in homelessness. We have 60% uh, of the county is black. Do you support a human rights commission that is independent and has investigation and adjudication power? Uh, can I answer? I am totally <coughs> devoted to the idea that we need to have opportunities for people to be housed. And over the last 20 years, I have been devoted to the idea of creating affordable housing and the practical aspect of creating affordable housing. 20 years ago, I sounded the alarm for what the problems are with housing in Kalamazoo, lack of affordability, and I've devoted most of my volunteer work life helping create affordable housing. Whether the answer to that is a commission, I am not certain how that would work in the city of Kalamazoo. But I can tell you this, is that I have brought wider groups together, county-wide groups, and I think that's the kind of help we need if we're gonna create a sufficient amount of affordable housing for people across Kalamazoo. I have a hard worker, will continue to do that work creating housing. Uh, in the time I've been at some of my, uh, at the nonprofits I've uh, volunteered for, 
We brought $50 million into Kalamazoo to create affordable housing. I wrote the millage that got passed in Kalamazoo County, which now has housed almost 300 families since it was passed. But we have to build collaborations. We have to reach across boundaries. And once again, this is an issue that we're going to have to address more than just in the city of Kalamazoo. We need everybody in the county to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, depending on when you wrote that bill to have 300 families house, as if it was 20 years ago, from 20 years ago to now, we didn't have an opioid epidemic that filled up half of downtown with drugs and the community. So that's a whole different ball game when we're talking about affordable housing. Because first we have to figure out why, what is the root problem? And no one's going to the root problem. I mean, it's easy to get somebody into a house. It's easy to get people there, but it's, it's hard to keep somebody from keeping their lawn up or staying away from drugs and maintain the property. People, it, 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 it keeps going. You know, a lot of times I see people will put $56 million, but I know too many people that are broke and they still don't have a house. So I, over the last 20 years, I've seen the same broke people not go anywhere. You know, without any education, ain't no one, without lack, you know, when you don't have any knowledge, you're not going to go anywhere. And so, you know, for the same thing from 20 years ago, it's a whole different ballgame. That's why I personally believe getting a young, energetic, young mayor that's in touch with the streets, in touch with the, the music, because this is the first generation where me and my kids listen to the same music. My parents hated rapping. They hated my music. And this is the first time where my daughter might be listening to Drake. And I'm like, I was just listening to that. So there's a connection there. So I think that, I think that there, it's, there's, there's, there's so many homes, you know, and I still think that most people shouldn't have a 10 bedroom house when there's people homeless. I think we need to get out of the streets and ask people really what is the problem of why aren't you housed? You know, I don't think we're doing that. I think we're just only saying we're gonna do a lot of money and nothing's getting solved. Everyone in our community deserves access to housing. However, we know discrimination keeps people from accessing safe and affordable choices at times resulting in homelessness. Do you support a human rights commission that is independent and has investigation and adjudication power? Yes, human rights commission come in. Uh, yes, absolutely. I do agree that we need something along the lines of the human rights commission to make sure that people have affordable housing. Uh, one of the best arguments for that is the, the work that the Matt Smith has done, and a lot of people have seen his uh, presentation about redlining. Yeah. Our city is still deeply, deeply segregated. And we have known this for a very long time, and we haven't been able to get past that. So we have to do better. Uh, if you look at where the city is at right now, in the 17-18 uh, fiscal year, the city met about 60% of its goal for housing people in affordable housing. I, I'm a teacher. 60% is a D. That's not good enough. You know, we need to do better than that. So we need to be very aggressive in making sure that every single person has access. Uh, there's a program that is, uh, I, I really like the way it's worked, out of Seattle, and they call it a housing navigator. So they help people who are looking for affordable housing, set them up with someone who will not just find them housing, but will find them housing in neighborhoods that offer more economic uh, and social opportunity. So it gives those residents a chance to have more often a chance to move forward in whatever their goals in life might be. It's a way to create equality and a way to fight segregation in communities. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the, um, the key word there is discrimination. Um, if you think about people who have, uh, with felony backgrounds who can't get affordable housing or access to housing, um, that box that's on that application um, is the process of elimination. Uh, the public perception about people with felonies are that they're bad people and they will always be bad people. 
And that's just a category of people that we're talking about housing. Uh, there's many categories. And so I think if we, if we take a comprehensive look at this and not just um, say, well, it's gonna be dealt with this way and that's the best way. We have to take an approach where uh, we utilize collaboration because uh, the key to solution is collaboration. And so um, a committee that could uh, steer that um, would be awesome. I agree with that. Uh, but you, you look at how people are discriminated against when it comes to housing. Uh, some, it might be because of um, eviction. Um, some might be because they have um, uh, no credit, right? Um, and so we have to change that. We have to change that. And we have to work really hard at doing that. And so there's no one way to fix this issue. but we shouldn't make people pay more for what they already paid for when it comes to uh, a crime they committed, right? Um, we, we tend to do that in employment, we tend to do that in housing, we tend to do that in all of the resources we, we offer here in Kalamazoo. And so that's one of the things that I really want to work on uh, because everybody should have fair housing. Everybody should have access to that. Uh, we've been looking at um, a program called Housing First where um, it helps people get housing first, right? Then uh, supportive housing, then um, uh, supportive uh, services. So if we can figure out that model and implement it here on a greater level, we can impact housing in different categories. And so that's just one of those things you can look online and, and look at what Housing First is doing in the country. Thank you. Uh, question three. We got a lot of uh, questions about housing. Uh, if they currently <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now we're going to use a program like the Ben Carson Pilot Ordinance that allows corporations to avoid taxes if they say they can offer affordable housing, however, with no obligation to actually offer affordable housing. Yep. Do you support this approach to affordable housing? And if not, what st uh, steps do you take to change it? Uh, can it next? Uh, no, no. Uh, I think that when we go down the road of trying to put corporate interests before the interests of the residents and the people, we're always going to end up with a unsatisfactory solution. Yeah, housing is about the people who live there, and it has to be about the people who live there first. Uh, and that's got to be our primary goal. Uh, and there's lots of creative ways that we have at our disposal. There's the CDPGs and uh, Community Development Block Grants, which of course don't have nearly the funding that they used to, so it's been, yeah, uh, it's a tool that works, but it's not as good as it used to be. Uh, we've got round we've got pilot work, we've got all kinds of different ways that we can be creative. If we can creatively find solutions to build a arena, we can creatively find solutions to build affordable housing. And until we can do that, I just really don't think our community is going to be the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Currently, Canada do use a program like the Ben Carson Title Ordinance that allows corporations to avoid taxes if they say they can offer affordable housing, however, with no obligation to actually offer affordable housing. Do you support this approach to affordable housing? And if not, what steps will you take to change it? So, no, I don't support. Um, that um, because again, it's corporations getting rich, corporations still getting you know the amount of money they want for housing, they can you know set the rent whatever they want, right? And it's one of those things, um, that I think that's uh, um, one of those rights that we deserve here in Kalamazoo is the right to affordable housing, right? And so, when you think about affordable housing, you think about like the income bracket they fall into when you have somebody who has a fixed income of $700 a month, like my dad. Um, he can't get quality housing. He can get slum lord housing because they don't do a, a credit um, background check. Um, they don't really care about the, their housings, uh, their homes. And so uh, one of the things, again, with Housing First, man, it, 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 it takes an approach where um, it gets people in housing and then uh, gives them the services they need. And everybody doesn't need services, right? like some people do, and so housing is a big issue. If I, can, if I can go and get, and not worry about housing, how better can I do my job when I'm working or looking for a job or trying to live life in a way where I don't have to worry about where I'm gonna lay my head. Um, and so we have to come up with uh, strategic ways and creative ways. I mean, we have so much creativity in this city that we are not tapping into because 
It's about who's right and not what's right. We have to shift that narrative of who's right. So that, that process makes it who's right. Um, uh, we have, again, shifting that narrative to what's right, coming together to make that process happen. We have so much resources, over 600 um, nonprofits in town, so much capital in this city. We talk about how we can make the change and do it, and we gotta be about the action. We gotta stop talking about it because the processes are there and it's able to happen. Why haven't we been able to do it? Well, because the rich keep getting richer and the poor stay poor. Okay, thank you. So there is no such ordinance in the city of Kalamazoo as it stands now that gives corporations tax breaks for providing some affordable housing which they don't end up providing. As, it, as the situation is in Kalamazoo, is that how Kalamazoo participates in helping create affordable housing, and the majority of the affordable housing in the county happens to be in the city of Kalamazoo, because the city of Kalamazoo has been very supportive of developing affordable housing, is something called a payment in lieu of taxes program, which the city of Kalamazoo provides to developers who must commit providing affordable housing at very specific rents and are held to that. If they're not, they lose that, not only the tax credit, but more. We've done this work. Can we do better? We definitely can do better. And right now, for example, because I'm part of Lyft Foundation, we just finished a project called 79 units of permanent supportive housing off of Gall Road. It took me nine years, unfortunately, to get that done, to pull all the financing together. But now that we have resources from the Foundation for Excellence, there are beginning to be gap fillers, like this described, we're losing our CDPG money. We have more opportunities now to create more decent, safe, and affordable housing in the city of Kalamazoo. I've led on that. I will continue to lead on that. It is something I deeply believe in. Thank you. Anybody in here understand what he said about the, how about the, does anybody else, how many renters we got here? How many homeowners that are, are renting out multiple unit properties? Anybody? So he's on his own. So we're up on a totally different lane here. So I want to be a, like that eventually. And I can see my tax bracket going up at the harder we work. But affordable housing we got to get out there and help each other, us, not these guys who are building all these buildings around here. Because $3,600 at the exchange, I not know how too many people are moving in there. $2,600 at the exchange for one bedroom apartment. This is, this is ridiculous. Everything's going up. And we have all these buildings coming in doing a great job. But, and they say all these minorities are working. And this. I go to these jobs because I don't see it. I don't see all the money set aside. You know, I think personally, more minorities need to get on the, the ground and start making more of a ruckus about affordable housing ourselves. And stop going to everybody else, asking all these corporations, because about tax right up they're already writing everything off on other things. We don't even know how to, most of us don't even know how to do general tax write-offs. Writing off your shoes, or writing off your gas for work, or writing anything off, you know? He knows every loophole or tax or whatever you want to say, and no one else does. So I think we have to start from the bottom. Everybody needs to get educated. Get somebody that is on your level to run. And then once you get somebody that is in the same neighborhood as you, or somebody who's not scared to go to the north side tonight, because most of the people, I bet you are not going to go to the north side. Or you're going to, you're scared. Or how many people in here will hang out down here in Washington? I know that's no will. I know I will. This question is a two part question. How are you planning to help homeless re entry and veteran women? in Council County. It's a little bit different than just um, being homeless. So we have veterans that um, need special care. So how are 
what would you do for returning uh, entry women and veteran women and women and chicken? Okay. Um, again, our VAWs, right? We gotta support them. We have to um, use some of that uh, foundation for excellent money to support that. Like one of the biggest things that I have an um, issue with is returning um, veterans. Um, is that it's always the poor people's kids that are re returning back, right? I've never seen a millionaire or billionaire's kid go to war because uh, they want to, right? And the, the people serving our country are the, the lower class people, right? Um, and so uh, that's one of those things that has been like, if, if my kid ever talked to me about going to serve for our country, I'd tell him, hey, that's not in our, that's not, that's not for us. Um, and so one of those things is giving the support to those places so that they can get that support. I mean, uh, there's so much money has been cut from that, right? And so uh, the, the more we're taking money away from those um, services that our vets need, they're, no, that money's going somewhere else, right? I don't know where the heck it's going, uh, but it's going somewhere else. And so we need to uh, continue to um, challenge and advocate and uh, champion for our vets, the man my heart breaks for vets. And so, yeah, we need to use some of the ex uh, foundation of excellent money to help the, uh, that process. I think, hey, just a couple quick things starting here. I don't own this housing, I just happen to be on non-profit boards that develop it, so I don't make a penny for all the time. <laughs> no, I don't get paid for that. All volunteer work, the shared public housing commission for 17 years, president of 20 years, totally volunteer. That's how I spend my hobby time. I don't make a penny to personally not any of that work. Let's talk about vets for a second. So, we are in the poise right now because of the work I've been doing over the last 10 months, pulling veteran service organizations who don't happen to work together in Kalamazoo County, and someone else who's here in the Public Housing Commission can attest to that independently, pulling veteran services organizations together to end veteran homelessness in Kalamazoo County. And what have we done? We've gone through months of work trying to pull folks together don't spend time together, don't talk, pull those folks in the room, Veteran Service Office at the county, Volunteers of America, VA, VFW post folks, we come up with a plan. And that plan is done. And that plan is two things. Centered around the Public Housing Commission that I have led into this work. And we're going to come out soon and say we have a plan to end veteran homelessness. And what's the Public Housing Commission going to do about that? Our job is going to be fill all the gaps that the other services do not currently fill. And we are creating, starting work on it in about a week, a veteran-specific shelter here in Kalamazoo County <coughs> that is going to bring resources to veteran needs particularly. Look for that in the press. We're going to make an announcement about it. But our commitment, all together, from the Public Housing Commission, from veteran service organizations, is we are going to end veteran homelessness in Kalamazoo County. Um, this one hits home hard because there's a couple of things that about making a penny off of it. I've heard Donald Trump say that, but you know he don't never make a penny off of anything. The last two years, my father-in-law he fought in Vietnam and her, and he had Agent Orange, and so I've watched him die slowly and and go from hospice and, and basically closing my business down because we were taking care of him. He wanted to, to pass away at home. And I never realized how hard it is to take care of somebody who is dying from liver failure. And it, it was about two years until he passed away January 16th. So this going to the VA every day, driving, doing dialysis, going through all these different things, and, and, and seeing this, you know, it's simple as just kids or somebody going to visit these people. When you walk into the VA in Battle Creek, it's painted blue. It's like the worst color possible when you walk in. It's depressing. You've got men and women that serve their country, and they have no family, they have no friends, there's nobody. And, and you give them all the money in the world, and it doesn't mean anything. A hug, a, somebody talking to somebody, just showing that you care. That means more than money itself. And I do agree, we need to build some more things or, or development sites where veterans get more attention. 
because I seen it and it is cool. It's, I was one of the guys who had a check in that box when I was young. And I've been in that place and I've been in the VA. And I'd rather be in the first place than the VA because that's how bad it is. And these people have fought for our country. And it's sad. Yeah, this is a serious issue that we just need to do better not to start with. Uh, we, there's there's reentry and there's homelessness as two parts of this, and we need to address both of them. The place where we have to start is we have to start by reaching out to the partners who have the best insight into the problem. So we reach out to the veteran services officers like, and we ask them, what exactly can we do to help? Because they're the people on the ground with those uh, returning veterans on a regular basis. So that's where we start. Then we start, we move there to partner with the county because the county has the resources we need to help the veteran population. Then we look at what are some of the problems. It's not just housing, it's how do we help with employment. So how do we help find employment opportunities for people returning from, uh, from, from war zones? Another thing that we have to consider is the mental health component. Uh, one of the biggest issues for veterans is mental health, particular PTSD. And one of the things that we can do so much better is we can help veterans by easing their access to medical cannabis which has been shown to have very significant positive effects for PTSD, but they cannot get that through the VA because the VA is still operating under the federal government's Schedule One drug policy, and the VA doctors are under gag orders, so they can't even talk about it with their patients. So we have to make that available without, without restrictions here in Kalamazoo, which makes it easier for veterans to deal with the issues that they health this issues they're facing, it's going to make it easier to get jobs and then easier to get housing, and those are some first steps. Thank you. Next question. This, is, this question comes from some students that witnessed uh, police uh, pulling up to uh, a middle school here in Kalamazoo, and this is their question. What would you do differently to create school improvements that would remove the need for police officers uh, to come into the school? Uh, can I yeah. So a lot of the questions you're asking are specific and you know um, one of the things that I truly believe that is going to address most of those things is uh, establishing true community. When we can come together as a community and fill in those gaps where we think the police need to do or these housing things need to happen, if we can't develop true community, then all these things we're talking about don't make no sense because they're driven by policy. They're driven by ordinances. And what we're talking about is human beings. Policies can't love human beings. Ordinances can't love human beings. And so if we can't create true community in our, in our city, we won't see these issues be taken care of. Um, parents get involved at school, right? Uh, creating that process. So one of, the big, one of the bigger things that I wanna do when it comes to collaborating is bringing all the resources we have to the table, churches, businesses, residences, the city, together so we can develop that sense of community, right? When you have true community, when you have neighbors looking out for each other, having each other's backs, what happens? It's a safer place. When you start to, when you start to teach your kids morals about not bullying kids, right? What happens? It becomes a safer place, right? When we can speak out against the injustices that are happening in our schools, um, it's crazy. Um, and, and, I, and I appreciate the, the uh, questions, but we're missing a gamut of things that are taking place in our city. When, when you have single parent women pimping out their daughters just to get a fix, nobody's saying nothing about that. When you have a meth epidemic running rampant through our streets, nobody's saying nothing about that. When you have a highway that's a pipeline between Chicago, Kalamazoo, and Detroit that's flooding our cities with these drugs, nobody's saying nothing about that. We always want to talk about the things that are at hand, but there's a true narrative out there that everybody really needs to see that if we don't start to build true community in Kalamazoo, all these issues will continue to keep happening. Uh, that every single one of the things we talk about 
is based on underlying inequalities throughout the system. It's based upon a system of oppression that, it, whether it's sexist, racist, LGBTQ, whether it's uh, the environment, whether it's classist, that we are, we have a system of oppression, and until we do something about that bigger system, it's going to be harder to deal with everything else. But on the point at hand is how do we help protect students in schools without resorting to bringing police into those schools. And I think the very best thing that we can do uh, from the city's perspective is support every single possible initiative to get licensed social, social workers in every single school. We do that and we you know think about all the kids who are LGBTQ, how tough it is for them in, in our school system. Think about kids who are poor and the, the discrimination they face for not having what their, their, their classmates have. Think about the racial, racial issues. A lot of the violence and the problems we have comes from a position of conflict that can be taken care of, can be uh, moderated if we just have people to have someone there to help them. So licensed social workers are the so, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that Esto and I did not really know each other very well before this campaign started. <laughs> but now we have gotten to spend some time together, not just chit-chatting about the weather, but talking about things that we deeply care about. And I can tell you this, if you want to hear from someone who speaks from the heart every time they talk, look at this man right here. And I appreciate that. And that drives better things. And I think the point in my impression that he was making is that we got to do this together. This has got to be the whole community. Mm -hmm. We have to come together and support each other in this work. We can't be battling each other while we do this stuff. And if we don't all come together, we're not going to be successful. Well, what can the city do? Well, the kinds of things the city's already doing and going to do more. Thousand young people participating in work and recreational programs in the city of Kalamazoo, supported by the Foundation for Excellence. That's a great thing we can do for young people in the summer. Our group violence intervention program, which was pushed by Isaac, which is adopted by the city of Kalamazoo, which has been particularly effective in trying to address that violence piece. The engagement we're doing between public safety officers and young people who've had multiple interactions with the criminal justice system. Building relationships, building community, heading off what can happen for young people if mistakes occur. That's the part the city can do. The city can partner with resources, work with the resources we have, support good partners like Momentum, and do this work together because that is what we all care about. Yeah, I, I personally think there's two different views with the police. Um, you have, I can probably guess that the police weren't at 40 North or at 40 mm -hmm. They probably were at County Central or North North. And those are more of an urban school. So usually the cops are called in situations because of a lot of, you know, housing problems. You know, not housing like actual housing, but the parents. The parents not being involved. You know, I don't think we're going to get away from police culture. I think this is going to get worse, and, and, and it's just one of those things that the community can do everything they need. There's going to there's, eventually there'll be a police officer at most schools. You're not going to stop mass shootings. You're not going to stop this. You know, I, it's weird because I don't even know a lot about guns, but my son plays Call of Duty, and he can name six thousand different guns and how to use them. And all these kids know how to do it. They will tell you exactly what kind of gun, what kind of they are, and if it has this many rounds, and this, and this, and this. And all these games are teaching this stuff. And as long as that is what is in the household, it's not going to change. I mean, we could, the police are going to be there. The urban, it's, they're usually in the urban area. And then the police come to a mostly maybe a white school if it's shooting or something. You know, a lot of the urban kids aren't going to the mass shooting. So there's two different ball games there. But with the policing in the schools, I agree with um, the mental education, the, the needing psychiatrists, the license to, to prevent it and someone to speak. And that is the biggest thing I think 
that can stop. I mean, these kids have to have somebody to talk to and they trust them. And so I think that's the number one way of stopping any of the police. This is the end. I don't know. I'm going to transition. That's a good transition to the next question. There has been a rise in gun violence in the city. What we do to address this issue? So I'll start with you, uh, Cameron. It's a tough one. It's, 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 it's really tough. You know, I'm, uh, I kind of put my money where my mouth is. And the next couple months, I could have opened up on the west side of town zoo or out in Texas Township. But I'm opening up a juice bar next door uh, for the community. I'm opening up another business next door. And so, and these are in the environments where me and Esco, we've seen a 14-year-old kid get gunned down. You know, uh, uh, an extended family member got murdered a couple blocks away, and, and he left my shop when I had my tattoo shop here before. And I left because it was so much gun violence. But now I'm a little bit more mature where we have to step up as a community, and we have to band together and start, you know, teaching these kids about gun violence because they're getting more guns. More kids are coming from Chicago here. The Chicago violence. These kids are learning from somewhere. Until you ask the kid where he's learning it from, then that's the answer. No one, we're asking each other, but we need to ask these kids. Like, how do you know how to pack this gun? I, where did you get it from? You know, most they're, they're getting them from Indiana or different places where it's easy to get it. You know, so until we talk to these young kids and start talking about the value of life, it, it's, 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 it's kind of sad. But more people have to be bold and open up in these areas. And instead of, I know there's a lot of money downtown, but these places around here need to be, you know, brought up. Thank you. Can I so just talking about guns, there are specific things the city can do and will continue to do. For example, we have had gun buyback programs in the city of Council. Also, we are deeply involved in youth engagement as it relates to helping young people see a different life for themselves. And that really gets, I think, to the next thing, which is not as specific, but it's this. If you imagine that you have a life for yourself, if you have hope and you can see a future that is a good future for you, to me that is the best antidote for getting involved in you know, neighborhood altercations, beginning to carry guns, if you can imagine a trajectory for yourself. And that is what the city is doing now and intends to do more of to support pathways for hope. Support pathways for imagining better, better futures for young people in this town. Taking advantage of the fact that we do have the Kalamazoo Promise in town. Are young people going to be able to take advantage of that? How can we support that? What about our summer programs? What about more work that we're doing with business incubators, with supporting tech education in town? I believe that each individual has to see a path for themselves to a positive future, and then they will make that choice. At the end of the day, we have to pe people have to see an opportunity for themselves for benefiting from doing the hard work. And that's how the city can help with that. So uh, this gun violence issue is uh, dear to my heart. Uh, when my son was uh, five years old, he was shot in the leg in a drive-by right here where I live. Um, so it's really, it hits really close at home. Uh, working with the group violence intervention is something where we are um, diminishing gun violence because you have people like me, like Michael Wilder, uh, Yefencio, and other people who are going and, and paying <coughs> visits to these, these people who are shooters, right? We are putting ourselves in proximity to these people and we're saying, look, these activities can't happen anymore, but if you want help, if you need a job, if you need help with ID, if you need some, if you need a, a, a technical training, we can give that support to you. So I was a product of my environment when I was a young kid. I was introduced to a lot of trauma as a young boy. Both my parents were subject to the crack, the crack epidemic in the late 80s when it hit. And um, one of those things that uh, drove my truth was being conditioned 
by this narrative that's being perpetuated in my environment. And that's what I thought I should have been because that's all I knew. It wasn't until somebody taught me otherwise. It wasn't until somebody spent time with me, told me I had a purpose, showed me I was significant, showed me that I could be uh, more than what I made life to be. And it wasn't until then, until I believed in myself, that I could be something different. And with gun violence, it's, it's not that people are out carrying guns because they want to be violent. That's not the issue. It's because these young men are afraid of their lives. They want to protect themselves because there's a lot of crazy stuff happening. And so we have to look at it from a, from a different perspective. And, and uh, Bridging Opportunities is working with the juvenile um, uh, center and, and, and trying to catch uh, young individuals before they get to that place. Nine times out of ten, if somebody's growing up in a household and they see their uncle, their cousin, their brother, their dad involved in gangs, guess what they're going to be? That's just the narrative. So um, I'm, I'm working on GVI. I'm, I'm diminishing gun violence on a daily basis. We have, we have changed what gun violence looks like in Kalamazoo. <coughs> This is a real problem for Kalamazoo. Um, it's a problem that somebody with the privilege that I have doesn't necessarily need to see. Uh, and I think that's something we really need to get our, our, our hands around, is that this is something that a lot of people in our community can walk through life and never really know what's going on. Uh, but at the end of August, there had been more shootings in the city of Kalamazoo than there had been the entire previous year. That's a problem. This is a problem that's accelerated. If you look at just uh, overall crime statistics, Kalamazoo gets a crime index score of three, which means that there are only 3% of American cities that are more dangerous than Kalamazoo. That's scary, and that's something that not everyone in this community has to face on a daily basis. If we are going to do anything about this, we need to make sure that everyone knows and that everyone is part of the solution. The way that I think that we need to start is the same way I think we need to start all of the major problems that our city faces, and that's a series of town halls. Because we are not doing our job at the city if we're not actively moving out into the community, creating opportunity to encourage feedback <coughs> from the citizens, because we cannot pass ordinances that we expect to see the city uh, embrace and that we expect to see work if we don't have the full support of the city behind us. We're running short on time, so uh, because we started the forum late, uh, this last question, this is a loaded question, so please listen carefully. We have a jot a couple things down, but I'll go to the bottom. Do you support changes to the to city charter in regards to a, solar panels on all publicly funded buildings. B, creating a ward system. C, publicly funded elections. D, elected community controlled land bank trust. E, resident requirement for all city employees, fire, police, teachers. F, uh, recall referendum for all elected posts, including city council. And G, a progressive tax, uh, wealth tax.
Um, yeah, um, that, that's one of those things where um, when we talk about equality and equity, um, you think about how much uh, people own more property. People, and especially people who live outside of the city. Uh, this is an issue. We have people who live outside of the city who would get this tax because they don't care about Kalamazoo, but they have a buttload of property here, right? They have a buttload of uh, assets here. And so that's one of those things where we got to we gotta take care of Kalamazoo, right? And so, um, yeah, that would be a deeper conversation with the progressive wealth tax. Thank you. And then it's going down line. We're in. Sounds good. Okay, I'll start at the bottom and work up. Progressive wealth tax. That is, not, the state of Michigan does not allow that. We cannot tax in the city of Kalamazoo. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. We have no choice about that. Change the laws of the state of Michigan. There can be some choice here. We had no control over an income tax rate, a wealth tax. We don't. It's all set by the state and, of course, national. Recall referendum on all elected posts. I mean, that you can always do a recall. There's nothing special about that. Residence requirement for all city employees. That already went to court, Michigan Supreme Court, can't require that. That happened years ago. You cannot require city employees to live in the city of Kalamazoo. Elected community controlled land bank. We do have a land bank that is a county land bank. That land bank is, has membership on it that is appointed by an elected board, and that is the county board of commissioners. So they appoint the members of the land bank. So you got an inroad into that if you don't like land bank members. Publicly funded elections. Okay, I'm not quite sure who's going to fund that, but uh, I, I suppose it's an interesting thing to talk about. I do not support creating a ward system. Doesn't work in Ballot Creek right now, where they have a partial ward system. Uh, solar panels on all public funded buildings. I think we need to incorporate some significant expectations related to energy conservation, whether it's solar panels or not, I don't know in buildings that are funded publicly, and that is it. So thank you so much. <laughs> yes, to all of them. So the question <laughs> is, is, what's the legal need to whether or not we can do it? The question is, do I support it? These are all great ideas. Every single one of them, I'd love to see them apply. Uh, and just a couple to hit on. Solar panels and all publicly funded buildings. We are insanely irresponsible for not being more aggressive in addressing renewable energy and creating more infrastructure for it. That should be, that, that should be basic. Uh, creating a ward system. I think that works for the same reason those of you who were here earlier heard uh, uh, Commissioner Candidate Andrews talk about it. If we want fair representation in the city where each neighborhood knows it has a representative, a representative that is from that neighborhood, who represents that neighborhood, gets elected for what they do for that neighborhood, it will always answer to the neighbors that yes, we should have a ward system. Publicly funded elections. This is, if I was at a, a uh, organizer meeting uh, a couple of years ago, and we were asked, what is your political dream? Publicly funded elections is my political dream. If we want to get the big money out of our political system, if we want candidates to speak to residents instead of to donors, if we want to see forward-thinking progress on things that we all need, then the taxpayers should fund the elections. And yeah, you might say, oh, taxes, funding elections. Well, you know, if the people who get elected are responding to what the taxpayers want, then it will work. So the taxpayers should be the people who are funding the elections so that they listen to what the taxpayers want. Uh, and the rest of them, yes, they're all good. This is great. We should do this. This would make the whole world a better place if we all did all these things. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think my shirt might say, and best for all these two. It was all that you had. The solar panels situation. Who's going to pay for that? That's it's a great idea, but who's going to pay for that? Uh, the wealthy. Uh, well tax. If it did exist and all that, I I feel there's two different ways because if you're low income, you're you know, and then I give you a million dollars. Of course, you're going to be like, oh. That's fine. I don't like that. So that's kind of a, a tricky situation there. Um, 
uh, creating award system, public funded elections. Um, no, it should be it should be private. Um, mm -hmm. Use for a change to the city charter. It's yes, yes, no. These are I don't know. I, as these kind of hard to answer because to me some of these are like kind of make believe. I'm just sorry. I'm just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, with that, that's going to wrap up our session portion of the So uh, we have a very short amount of time, so uh, I'd like to give you a minute okay. to do your presentation. So, uh, uh, Thank you very much. I really appreciate being able to get together and have a conversation tonight about things that we all care about. And if you look at my history, which luckily is not over yet, you will see that for the last two or three decades from my time as president of the Low Income Neighborhood Association for 15 years, to chair of the Public Housing Commission, to president of the Lyft Foundation, to serving with great people on the city commission for 14 years, trying to do the good work of creating shared prosperity here in Kalamazoo. I want to keep the work that is getting started going forward. That is what I'm committed to. I am a volunteer for Kalamazoo. And that is the work that I believe we need to do together. Big tent, bring everybody in. Let's not make this circle smaller. Let's make this circle bigger. Thank you. Okay. Um, so for me, I think we, some, we need some fresh blood in there, right? Uh, we need some, uh, so I, I consider myself a servant leader. Out front, in the trenches, doing the work, right? That's what we need. We need to shift. Uh, the way we look at the, the mayor and what his position is um, and that public figure. We need a servant leader with good leadership, strong vision to move Kalamazoo forward. Um, I truly believe that I can bring that. I'm a connector. I can bring people together uh, when it comes to collaboration. We need to be build true community in this city. And I truly believe that if we can do that, we can be an example to the nation. I truly believe that with the resources, uh, the, 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 the creativity, all the things we have in Kalamazoo, I truly believe that we can be an example for the country. Uh, we're already doing it with some programs that we're offering for Momentum, planning in Iowa. So I mean, it can happen. Just imagine it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I was a victim of violence and I almost died, and I became the shooter. So at one point in my life, I was that guy. So I faced the court system, I faced all that stuff, and for me to be sitting here today on the opposite spectrum is amazing. And it gives me the chance where I've been to Lakeside, I've spoken at Kalamazoo College, at Western Michigan State, to younger kids about gun violence, and, and, and being in the prison system, and being locked up, and to make a change. And I think, like you said, we need younger blood. We need somebody that understands our youth, because our youth are our future. And if we got, a bunch, if we got older people that cannot relate to these kids, it's going to be out of control. We are the ones that are going to have to lead this next generation of kids into be successful. And I think myself, myself, we're the younger generation that do that. I've been born and I've had the money. So. I'm running for this seat because I think we need something different. We need to have a mayor who believes in listening to people and having conversations. That's why the campaign that my team and I are running is about outreach. We have, I was looking at the numbers the other day, we have contacted at the door literally tens of thousands of people. And we always start that conversation with what is it that you would like to see the city change to make your life better. That defines why I'm running. I believe that the reason the city government exists is to make the lives of residents better. And we need to find out how to do that. How can we create better jobs? How can we create a cleaner environment? How can we get rid of discrimination? How can we create safer communities? And how can we create a better council? Thank you. Thank you.
Before we uh, leave and go our separate ways, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. It really means a lot to you all to come out and show that you really care about the city. Um, I can uh, I want to um, acknowledge again uh, Showtime Cuisine for preparing the food, uh, Matt Smith for the dynamic uh, presentation that you shared throughout the community and the uh, uh, information that's available. Uh, Devin Weinberg from Life Effect earlier, Allen Chapel, Annie Church, and specifically uh, Edison Neighborhood Association for allowing events like this to continue on. The NAACP, uh, NAACP for having voter registration available for um, everyone on Kenya. Our uh, wondrous uh, timekeeper, a student from Kalamazoo uh, Central. Yeah. Uh, I didn't introduce him earlier. He's an uh, eighth grader that parked in middle school. And uh, Danielle Baker again uh, was the moderator for uh, the city commission forum. And I also want to thank Sophia. She was out in the other room uh, monitoring and watching so that some of the other you uh, that they were here. And I just want to. Uh, uh, encourage everyone to keep having this conversation. There's going to be uh, a few more uh, uh, candidate forums leading up to the um, election. Please make sure you go to the go to the uh, uh, ballot, go uh, to your ballot to the forum. Um, thank you all for coming out. And thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I yeah, yeah, I get it. Well, yeah. Yeah. Steve, Steve, yeah, Steve, 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 Steve,
the answer to the virus, so I brought me into it. And then helped me, you know, then I realized, hey, I'm in the chemo clinic, there's hundreds of people in here that don't have access to this. And so I was like, well, I'm starting a retail location. And I'm wondering if I see how supportive this is. I'm starting at the provisioning center. If you want to arrest me, I'm right here. Come on. I'll come take my thing away. But no, we're going. And our people are going to have, I call it, you know, dignified access to medicine. Uh, you know, that's what, what we're going to get from the citizens. Of the I live in We don't like it. Come get it. And they said, well, we're working it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle. And there's a lot of red tape. And there's a lot of bias, of course, in every city. You know, now in charge of creating an ordinance to allow for it. So, like, 